Today we're going to talk about feral hash joints. Again, I'm just here in my home office. It's me uh, up here with the terrier in attendance. So uh, it'll be asking questions as, as we go along today. So why are hash joints important? Well, it's joins in general are important because that's one of the most common things operator we're going to execute uh, in analytical workloads. So for today, we're going to start talk about the background of what it means for to do a join algorithm uh, at a high level and then some of the history of the back and forth between the performance trade-offs of a hash join versus a sort merge join. Then we'll talk about how to do a parallel hash join and, and the different ways to do the, the three phases. And then we'll talk about how to build a hash table, the hashing scheme, and the hashing function. And then we'll finish off with a discussion of the evaluation of the, uh, based on some of the results that in the paper you guys were assigned to read. So the, uh, in the introduction class last semester, when we talked about join algorithms, we didn't really talk about how to sort of execute them in terms of multiple threads at the, um, in parallel. We mostly focused on trying to assess, uh, you know, how much disk I/O we, we were going to incur for the different algorithms. But now, in an in-memory system, we don't have disk, and now we want to maximize the amount of uh, parallelization we can get across on our cores and our CPUs. But now we need to focus on how we're actually going to, uh, you know, use our hardware efficiently to do the join. So a parallel join is just taking two tables, uh, two relations that we want to join together, but we're going to do this join across multiple threads. And we're going to try to sort of minimize the amount of contention and synchronization as possible uh, so that we get the best performance. So the two main approaches we're going to do to do joins in an OLAP system are going to be either hashing or, sort mer or sorting. And these are the, there's no other sort of way to magically be able to identify whether you have matching tuples. Right? It's, it's either one or the other. And so for this class also, that means we're not going to discuss uh, nested loop joins because that's like the worst case scenario in, in an OLAP system because it's just doing a brute force search of sequential scans over the tables to try to find matching tuples. So in OLAP systems, you're not going to see nested loop joins except for some rare cases when the tables are super small. And so for that reason, they're also, you know, it, uh, running those in parallel is the same way you would just sort of run a scan in parallel. Um, so there's not that much we can talk about here. The other thing I'll say also too, though, in OTP systems, you will see uh, nested loop joins because oftentimes, oftentimes these database systems that are designed for transaction processing workloads don't need to do hash joins or don't even need to do sort merge joins because they're not doing large joins between different tables. It's always doing foreign key lookups or small number of key lookups to go get data that you would then give out to the application or like render a web page. I think of like Amazon when you log in. There could be a, a, a nested loop join for taking Andy's account and getting all Andy's orders. So there'll be a foreign key reference from the, uh, the order customer ID to the customer table. All right? And then in that case, it's just an index nested loop join, which would be super fast and way more efficient than you would do a hash join because you don't need to build a hash table to do the join. You just use that, that existing index. So for this reason, an index and nested loop join at a high level is going to look a lot like a hash join is just that the the data structure you use to find matching tuples already exists because the OHP application already defined the index that you, you're going to do a join on. All right. So the, again, the, uh, the high level difference here is that a hash join builds a data structure uh, like an index that allows you to find the matching tuples. But when that query finishes, it throws away the hash table and the next query comes along and just re, it'll be, rebuild the hash table again. In a index nested loop join, the index already exists, so you don't need to build it on the fly. You just use that in order to find the matches for your tuples. But a big difference is that in OHP settings, this index is, is most likely going to be a tree-based data structure, so either B plus tree or a radix tree that we talked about before. And, and so that means you'll get log n lookups when you do the join. But for a hash join, you, using a hash table will give you on average O1 lookups, which is way more faster. Um, and so that's why nobody builds a B plus tree when you do a join, uh, with some rare, rare exceptions, uh, when you're doing like, you know, range, range predicates and things like that on the join, but we're focusing on equi joins. And so the ha for a hash join, we're going to, we're going to use a hash table because that's going to be more efficient. So the debate of whether sort merge join is faster than hash join, uh, is one of these classic, uh, problems in, in databases 
that over the last 50 years, it's gone back and forth of which, which approach is actually better. So in the 1970s, the conventional wisdom was that certain ridge join was superior because the amount of memory that was available to these early, early computers, early systems back then was, was quite limited. And they had algorithms to do external merge sort, so you could spill the disk and still sort the data. And so I, it's unclear whether they knew they, they could do a, a hash join that could spill the disk or not. But the conventional wisdom was the sort merge join was better because they already had that ex external merge sort algorithm. Then the 1980s came along and then there was this movement called uh, sort of database machines where they've identified that hash joins could be superior if you had uh, specialized hardware support to do the hashing or do the hash join. And so in the 1980s, the conventional wisdom was, was that hashing, hash joins were superior because they had uh, because they had hardware that could do it more efficiently than you could do sorting. So we, we, we don't really talk about database machines anymore. Like the idea, think of this as like, it's a custom appliance that has special instructions or special hardware specifically for the, a particular database system. They sort of went out of vogue uh, in the 1980s because Intel and all the other chip manufacturers were putting out new things, uh, new, new CPUs all the time. And you know, with Moore's law, things got faster and faster because you had more and more transistors. So by the time, if you were a database company, the time it took you to fabricate or design and fabricate your database machine with specialized hardware, and then actually put it in production and start selling it, Intel or whoever put out already new CPUs that were that negated any performance gains you had in your custom hardware. You don't really see this anymore, although it's, it's kind of coming back in vogue. Not so much with specialized hardware like they did in the database machines, but more like FPGAs, GPUs, and, and other types of hardware accelerators. That is, they're still commodity-based, but uh, you can design custom kernels with the database on them. Then in the 1990s, uh, there was this paper from Gertz Graffy, the same guy that did the Volcano, the same guy that did the, the B, B plus tree stuff we talked about before uh, with latching. He came out with a paper that said uh, that the algorithms are basically equivalent that for all different real world scenarios on the hardware that existed at the time, you wouldn't really see a noticeable performance difference between being uh, sort merge and hashing. So they, they were deemed equivalent. But then in the 2000s, uh, as there was more and more uh, analytical databases being uh, created, like Vertica, Greenplum, Astrodata, things like that, it was shown that hash joins were considered to be superior uh, on, the, on the hardware that was available at the time. And really since then, that's, that's been the case, right? In the 2010s, uh, it wasn't so much a debate about whether cert merge join was better than hash join. It, the debate was whether you want to do a partition hash join or a non-partition hash join, which is what we'll talk about today. And in the, in the, the current decade, again, unless there's some... Uh, Unless there's some major breakthrough in the hardware, I don't think that certain merge will ever come up on top again. I think hashing is, uh, is, has been proven to be superior in, in many cases. I mean, obviously, if your data is already sorted on the join key, uh, then you don't need to do the sort at all. You're just doing the merge phase. Then you know that's the best case scenario, and that that certainly will beat the uh, beat a hash join algorithm. But uh, databases do, normally don't keep things sorted all the time. All right, so let's talk about now what, what the last decade looked like, sort of how we got to where we're today and why I signed the paper you guys were reading. So again, the 2000, in the early 2000s, at, at the turn of the century, uh, it was deemed, the, the research showed that hash join was superior. So the, one of the key papers in this came out from Intel and Oracle in 2009, uh, where they showed that hashing was indeed superior than sort merge. Um, but they speculated that if we now had larger SIMD registers, in particular 512-bit SIMD registers, like AVX 512 for Intel, then sort merge join would actually be faster. Now, as far as I know, I've, there hasn't been a paper since 2017 when, when AVX 512 came out that has actually tested this theory. Uh, but it'd be interested to see whether that, that's actually, you know, whether this is actually true or not. But Again, still now, everyone's still just doing uh, hash joins. Then in uh, 2011, the researchers at Wisconsin put out a paper that started the, the debate of whether you want to do a partition hash join versus a non-partition hash join. Um, and we'll discuss these results uh, later, later in this lecture. 
But then the, the Germans with Hyper came out uh, and said, oh, Intel is actually wrong. And Wisconsin was wrong. Certainers join is already faster, even without the larger SIMD registers. And they showed how, how you could do this in, in Hyper. But then they came out a year later with another paper that said, ignore what we just said from the previous year. We were wrong. Hashing is actually superior, and here's, and here's a better implementation for it. Then in 2013, there was another paper from uh, researchers in Switzerland, from ETH, where they have a bunch of ways to make a Radix hash join uh, perform more efficiently. So Radix hash join and Radix partitioning join, we'll, we'll discuss this uh, in a few more lectures. They just showed how you can, you can do this more efficiently than a non-partition join. Um, but then another group of Germans in 2016 came out and said, everyone needs to, to hold up and, bef and stop publishing these papers that say, you know, here's my hash join algorithm, look, look how much better it is. They actually then did a, an exhaustive evaluation of all the different design decisions you could have in your, in your join algorithm to better understand what the trade-offs are and which one is actually going to be uh, better than another. So again, that's why I signed you guys this paper, because I get, rather than just saying, here's this one-off implementation that we did, as Wisconsin did, or Hyper did, or, or, or ETH did, they just sort of did a complete sweep over all different possible parameters in these implementations and showed, you know, in what scenarios would one be better than another. So, the, so now if you want to design our join algorithm, whether it's sort merge join or, or hash join, what are some things we should think about to make this thing run efficiently and get good performance? So at a high level, the two goals that we're going to have is that we want to minimize synchronization and mi minimize the cost of accessing memory while we do the join. So the first one's sort of obvious, right? We talked about this before. Uh, it basically means that we want to avoid having to take latches to protect critical sections of the data structure of our join um, so that we don't have any contention or conflicts between threads. So that every thread is basically running at full speed and they're not waiting for another thread to give up some, some resource. Right? So I'll say also too, this, this doesn't necessarily we need to make our algorithm latch free. Uh, and there are latch-free techniques to do sorting and, and, and merge, or sorting and, and hash joins. Um, it just means we need, to be, we need to be smarter about how we're, we're taking our latches. For the second one here, the idea is that we want to make sure that anytime we have a worker thread that's computing a join, anytime they have to touch data, access it to you know, do a check or write something, we want to make sure that that data is, is local to that core. Uh, and this could be either in the same NUMA region or ideally in the same CPU cache, right? We want to minimize the number of cache misses and minimize the number of uh, cross-interconnect traffic between, between sockets. So the way we can do this, this, this last one to improve our cache behavior, is twofold. So the things that are going to matter for most for us when we, when, we, uh, when we have our algorithm that's going to cause us to have cache misses is we need to account for the size of our cache and our TLAB, the translation look, look side buffer, so that we're not trying to access a large number of pages at the same time. So think about this. If I now need to touch 10 tuples, if those 10 tuples are, are in 10 different pages, I, I can only have five entries in my TLB that's mapping the vir virtual memory address to the physical memory address, then in order for me to execute, do my operations on those 10 things, I'm going to have to start evicting things from my TLB, and therefore I'll have a cache miss on the data that I want, plus a cache miss in the, in the TLB, so that'll make my access go twice as slow. So ideally, I want to be able to bring uh, a small amount of data, or the minimum amount of data I need to do whatever operations I need, need to do, and complete all those operations before I move on to the, uh, to, to the next thing. And that's sort of called locality, the temporal and spatial locality. So I'm just making sure that I'm accessing, if I access this thing multiple times, I want to do this within the same uh, short time window, so that it's always in the cache. And if I'm accessing multiple things, I want to make sure that they're close together, uh, either in the same cache line, or ideally in the same cache line, so that I'm not paying the penalty of multiple cache misses and polluting my TLB. So the way we can achieve this is, is, is we need to be, the way to achieve this we need to be aware of what kind of accesses we're going to do. And the two type of accesses are either sequential scans or random lookups. So with, with non-random access, where I'm just reading a, a sequence of, of bytes uh, in order, 
then again, I want to make sure that that data it will fit into a single cache line so that it's one you know, cache miss and one memory stall to go fetch it and bring, bring it into to, to the CPU. And then for everything I bring into my CPU caches, I want to execute as many operations as I can on them. If I do have to do random lookups though, I want to make sure that those random lookups are again clustered together within the same cache line so that I, again, I, I reduce the number of, of lookups that I have to do uh, to memory. So this is this classic trade-off between the number of instructions we're gonna have or the cycles we're gonna have to incur uh, versus the amount of memory. And so the, we'll see this you know, in a second, but like the way we can achieve all these things is through sort of careful partitioning and being aware of what data exists and in what location so that our threads are always accessing data that's, that's, you know, that's close to it. Okay, so for the parallel hash join, again, hash join is super important for us because it's, it's gonna be the most common join algorithm that's implemented in, in modern systems. And it, a lot of OLAP queries are gonna contain joins, so we want this to perform efficiently as possible. In the paper you guys read though, you saw that the, the join portion of one particular TPCH query actually was not the, the bulk of the execution time. I've actually seen numbers that go in both ways. I've seen numbers from Impala that shows the, the joins are like 45% of the time of, of the system. In the case of the, the, the sort of the testbed system you guys read about from, from, from Germany or Saarland, it was you know, maybe like less you know, 10 to 15% of the total time. So just how much of the, the time the system is gonna spend doing hash joins can vary from system to system, but certainly there's gonna be a lot of joins and these joins are almost always gonna be executed as, as hash joins. So we wanna run that as fast as possible. So at a high level, the goal is with the parallel hash join algorithm is that we want all our cores to be busy at all times. That nobody should be stalled waiting to get data no, should be, nobody should be stalled waiting for another thread to complete some operation before they can proceed. Ideally, we want everyone just running full blast all the time. And of course, this is easier said than done. So a hash join is comprised of three phases, partitioning, build, the partition, build, and probe. So we're gonna go through each of these one by one, um, but I just wanna sort of show this as, a, as an outline for where, where we're gonna go in this lecture. So in the first phase, is, it's entirely optional, the partition phase. And the idea here is that we want to divide our table, tables that we're joining together into smaller chunks based on the hash key um, so that in the subsequent phases, we can have threads just operate on, on just data in their partition. And they don't need to go look at uh, data in other partitions. So if you remember from the intro class, we talked about this, uh, doing partitioning and spilling buckets of disk. This is also called sometimes the, the grace hash join. Right, the, high, the grace hash join just means you're at a high level you're doing this, this partitioning phase. But how you do the partition can, can vary from, from one implementation to the next. And then once, whether or not we do uh, the partitioning, the next phase we'll, do the, we'll build the hash table. So this is where we're scanning through the outer table R, and then we're just gonna build a hash table on the fly for the, for the join key that, that our, our query is asking for. Then in the second phase, or the, sorry, the final phase for the probe, we're gonna do a sequential scan on the inner table S, and we're gonna look up its join key, hash it, do a probe into the hash table, see whether we have a match, and if so, then we'll produce, uh, we'll combine the tuples and pr produce as, as the output of the operator that's then fed up into the query plan. So the important thing to point out though is in this probe phase, and the paper you guys are assigned to read, in a real system, after you, if you have a match on the probe, you actually need to materialize this combined tuple and then, and then copy it into an, an output buffer for the operator. And a lot of the hash join papers that I showed at the beginning, or the join papers that I showed at the beginning, they actually don't do this last step just because uh, they, you know, they wanted their numbers to look really, really good or they, sort of, uh, they, they didn't really sort of think about it. But in a real system and in, in the Sarland paper, they actually do this last step, which is important because that can affect the performance of the, of the rest of the system. And we'll talk about the implications of this with early, material, early materialization and late materialization uh, in a few more slides. All right, so let's go to each of these phases uh, separately and we'll talk about the different ways to implement them. So again, the, the partition phase is where we're gonna take the both relations, the inner one and the outer one, we're gonna scan through them, look at the join key, hash them, and then assign them to some output buffer, or the partition buffer. And so 
the whole idea of this is that although we're paying an extra, uh, an extra cost of having to scan through the data and copy it once, the idea is that if we're intelligent about how we do this, we can write the data out in such a way that when we do the build and probe, uh, we'll minimize the number of, uh, or reduce the number of cycles we have to execute those instructions because we'll minimize the number of cache misses. And we'll make sure that the, 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 the threads are operating on, on data that's, that, that's local to them. All right, so again, the idea is we pay this upfront cost to make other stuff go faster later on. So sometimes in this literature, as I said, sometimes it can be called a greatest hash join, sometimes it's called the hybrid hash join or the radix hash join, right? Whenever you see those sort of these qualifiers in front of the hash join, it just means that they're doing some kind of uh, partitioning step in front of it. So as I said in the last slide, uh, we need to be aware of what we're actually putting into our buffers because uh, that's going to greatly affect the performance. Well, it turns out the, what you actually need to put in your buffers is going to depend on what the storage model is that we talked about before. So if it's a row store, usually they put the, the entire tuple in the output buffer because even though I only may, maybe need a subset of the attributes to do the join or execute the rest of the query, it's just easier to copy some contiguous chunk of memory and write it into my output buffer or to my, my, my partition buffer. In a column store, oftentimes what you do is you only store the keys that you need to do the join uh, and then the offset to where to find the rest of the tuples if you needed to stitch it together. And the reason why you, you can do this is because uh, you want to do this is because you're minimizing the amount of data that you're actually copying, uh, copying from, you know, in, in, the, in these partitions. Um, and you don't have to worry about chopping it up as you would in a row store because it's already divided or partitioned for you as a column store. So the more efficient approach to do, again, is just the, the bare minimum uh, number, bare minimum information you need in order to compute the join. And then if another part of the query up above in the plan needs additional columns or additional attributes, you use the offset to go find, find that information. So for partitioning, there's two approaches. There's the non-blocking and the blocking partitioning or the radix partitioning. And so with the non-blocking approach, the idea is that you have a set of threads that, that are going to go through and partition the data. So scan the outer, outer inner table, start producing these partitions. And then uh, as it's generating this output, you can have another set of threads will read that data and start, start the next phase and start populating the hash table. Uh, Right? And you can do this because you're not worried about any false positive, false negatives, uh, or sorry, false negatives. Like as the data is partitioned, you can then immediately populate the hash table. Um, it depends on whether you're doing one pass or two pass, but in general for the non-blocking one, uh, people, do, people do one pass, right? In the second approach, uh, when you're doing the, the radix partitioning, the way it works is that you can have all the threads will scan through the, the, the table once, uh, and the tables once and produce the partitions. And because you don't know exactly uh, how far each thread has gone and you don't know whether, uh, since everything's already sort of broken up into buckets, you can't be guaranteed that you have all the data you need to fill the hash table. So all the threads will be doing the, this, this partitioning at the same time. And then when that completes, then you switch over and do the, uh, the build phase. So let's go through each of these one by one. So in the case of non-blocking partitioning, there's actually a, a, a two sort of subsets or two additional ways you can actually implement this. Uh, again, this is just, we're gonna scan the relation and then once and then build the output on the fly. So with shared partitions, you're gonna have all the threads try to write into the same memory locations at the same time, or the same buckets for your partitions. Um, and that means that you have to use a latch to synchronize the buckets to make sure that one thread doesn't, doesn't overwrite something that another thread wrote, wrote into incorrectly. In the second approach, you just have private partitions where each thread now has its own set of buckets that they can populate. There's no other thread writing to those buckets, so you don't need a latch to, to protect anything. And then once the, uh, once this sort of first phase is done, with, or first pass is done with the, the private partitions, then you can go through a, with another set of threads and then populate the, the, the global partitioning uh, buckets that, that you do in the first one. So again, classic, classic computer science here, there's no free lunch, right? On one hand, in this case here, we're using latches to protect the data structure, uh, but we only have to go through the, the partition in every pass once. In this one, it's latch free, but that now means that we have to then take a second pass through 
of the data to consolidate consolidate all the information that's spread out or, or divided amongst the different threads. So we'll go through. Let's go through each of these. So here's the uh, the shared partition approach, right? So we have our data table. We have three columns, and the first thing we're going to do is just divide up the data into different chunks or morsels, like we did before. Right? These are just ranges of data. We don't know actually what's in them yet. We just say, you know, the first 100 tuples goes to this thread, the next 100 tuples goes to this other thread. So now say we want to do a join on column B. So we'll take the value of B in every single tuple and we're going to hash it with the same hash function we're going to use for the, the build and probe phase. So the, we have to do this because we have to make sure that if we hash a key in one, in one phase, if we hash that same key later on, we end up in the same location or, or in our hash table or in our bucket to make sure we, we can find the information that we're looking for. So we're going to hash that, and we know the number of partitions we're, going to, we're, we're specified ahead of time, so we're just going to mod that by the hash value by the number of partitions, and that'll tell us what partition chain we're going to go into. So now every thread is going to write into, uh, for every single value, they hash it and mod it, and that tell you which, which one they're going to write into. And so again, this is a global uh, sort of set of buckets. So every thread can be writing into any, any bucket at any time. So we just have to use a latch to protect the, the, the last place where you want to do an insert. Right? And once you acquire the latch, then, then you can insert a new value in there. The other approach, again, is with private partitions. Same setup. We're going to divide the data up amongst different threads. Uh, and they're going to scan through and hash it. And then mod it by the number of partitions that, that we want to have. But what's going to happen is each thread has its own sort of group of buckets that we saw in the previous slide. So now when I do my write into these different buckets at each thread, I'm the only thread writing in there. I don't need to protect any of the latches, so this is going to go really, really fast. Now once all the threads are done, then I have to do, uh, combine everything together to create that global partition uh, space that I had in the last slide. So to do this, I can just have a bunch of uh, the threads uh, each pick a separate part, uh, you know, partition uh, group across the di different threads and be responsible for populating this thing. So I, in this case here, I don't need to acquire latches when I do this consolidation, but I still have to take a second pass. So thread two will go do partition two and thread three do partition three and so forth, right? So again, this is also a good example of where materialization issues can be, are, are important because I'm copying the data twice. I have to copy the data once out of the, the data table into my partition, and then out of the, the private partition into the combined partition. So if I'm a row store and I'm copying the entire tuple and my tuple is very large, then this copy is expensive. If it's a column store and I'm only copying the, the minimum amount of data that I need to do the join plus the offset, well, that can be much smaller than the full size of the tuple. And therefore this copying can be you know, less pressure on the CPU caches and memory, and certainly uh, potentially you know, less instructions. Okay, so, so that was an example of the uh, sort of the, the, the non-blocking partition scheme. Um, let's talk about now with the Radix partitioning approach. Uh, and the idea here is that we're doing the same kind of partitioning that we saw before, but we are being more careful, or not more careful, we are doing the partition in such a way that uh, we can... We, we can have the threads write to separate locations in memory without having to take latches, uh, but we have to wait until everyone finishes before we can move on to the next phase, because we, do, we don't know what, it, what else is, is missing. And that'll make more sense when, when we talk about, uh, when I show the diagram. So with the radix partitioning, we're going to take multiple steps to go, uh, uh, it's a multi-step pass over, the, each, over the, the relation. And so in the first step, we're going to scan through and compute a histogram that's going to tell us uh, the number of tuples we're going to have per hash key. Uh, and then we can use that histogram to compute what is called the prefix sum that'll tell us at what offset in our partition space should we write a particular tuple. Then now we're going to go through and uh, scan R again and now do the hashing. And based on where we we define where we sort of do our writes for the prefix sum, then we write into that the, the partition space. So again, we'll, we'll go through each of these one by one. So the first thing to point out too also is that the term radix partitioning is, is, just means the digit or a byte of the total key. It's the same radix uh, term that we saw when we talked about radix trees before. Right? Instead of having the entire key, 
I just I'm going to hash or partition uh, based on, on a chunk of it. And the prefix sum is just a way to do a again to determine what's the starting location that we want to write into our global global partition buffer for each thread. So let's let's, let's first understand what a prefix sum is. So again, the rate x is just the, the is just the the value of some digit within the key, right? So my keys are 89, 12, 23, 08, 41, and 64. So the rate x at this first position here for each of these keys would be 9, 2, 3, 8, 1, 4. And then the, the rate x for the next key is just 8, 1, 2, uh, and so forth, like that. So that's all that means. The rate x partitioning, we're going to look at one digit within the key at a time, hash that, figure out where that goes to, and then, if you want to do additional passes, we could look at uh, we could look at uh, we could look at subsequent digits. So, the in modern CPUs, you can compute this radix uh, pretty efficiently with this multiplication instruction. So, this is not it's not an expensive operation to, to, to do this. So, now with this radix, uh, with the radixes of these of the keys, we can compute what's called the prefix sum, and that's just a, a running summation, a running count of 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 the numbers and the position of the of of the prefix sum in the output determines is based on what keys came before it. So I have the keys one two three four five six. So for my prefix sum in the first position, the prefix sum is just one because it's just there's no nothing that came before it, so it's just the value one. But now for the next position, I'm going to take the value of the previous prefix sum computation and then the value of this key and add them together, and that's now my prefix sum for this position. So 1 plus 2 is 3. Same thing, now I take this position here, 3, 3, 6, 10, 15, 20, and 21, and so forth like that. And the reason why we want to do this is because now we can use these, these prefix sum to tell us again what offset we want to write into. Because we say, like, if I have one tuple before me, then I should start writing my, uh, my, my tuples at, at, after position 1. But then now this guy says I want to write tuples in, and he knows he should start at offset 3. Right? These are essentially going to be used as offsets within the partition array. So let's look at how to do this rate of partition. So again, the first step we need to do is inspect the input keys and create our histograms. So say the, output, the input keys that we're dealing with here are already the, the... We've already hashed it, we've already mod it by the number of, of partitions that we have. Uh, I'll just take it back. We haven't modified number of partitions. We've, we've hashed it, and now we want to look at the digits of the, of the hashes. So what we're going to do is look at, look at the, the first digit here. And for each, each thread, you're, just, you're going to scan through your assigned range and compute what the, the histogram is. Right? So it's the number of values that would appear at a particular partition. So in this case here, for CPU 0, at partition 0, it had two entries, 1, 2. At partition 1, it had two entries, 1, 2. Like down here, it has, at partition 0, it has 1, because uh, there's 1, 0 there. And then for partition 1, it has 3, 1, 2, 3. Right? We just compute this histogram by scanning through the data efficiently. Then so now what we're going to do is compute the offsets that, uh, in our partition array that the threads can all write into. So we have to block and wait until all the threads complete their partition. And then we now compute the prefix sum based on these histograms to tell us where we're going to start writing into, where every thread can write into this partition array. Right, so it'd be like this. So partition 0 for CPU 0 would write here, and then partition 0 for CPU 1 can write here. Right, so partition 0 starts at position 0 because with the prefix sum. Partition 0 at CPU 1 would write here because it's, this value is 2 because the prefix sum will, will be 3. So 1, 2, 3, and so forth for, for the other one. So now, what does this do for us? This is now going to give us a giant array, a giant buffer that uh, the, the threads can start writing into, and they don't need to coordinate or acquire latches to protect any, any uh, location in memory when it does this write, because it's already computed the prefix sum. We already know that nobody else is going to be writing to, to our location, so we can just write into it uh, just fine. And we have to maintain an internal counter on in our CPU to say, Oh, for partition zero, I've already inserted you know one thing or two thing or three thing. So using my starting point, I can then decide quickly at what offset should I write my 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 new my next piece of data into. All right. So now with this this uh, we've computed this this partition output and the starting locations where we do our writes. Now we go back and do our scan again, and now we do our partitioning. And now we're copying in the values of the of the keys that we've hashed into our partition array.
And again, we can do this without acquiring latches. So now at a high level, the way to think about this is that we've how, uh, we have partition zero and partition one. And so at this point, we could then hand that off to the build phase or, and, and start computing the hash table. Or if we wanted to, we could start dividing this up even further, do, or do sub partitioning again, uh, so that our chunk of data in each partition can now fit into a, a cache line or a small number of cache lines, right? And so to do that, we just go back now and do jump to the next, the next uh, radix, sorry, within this, the next radix value, and just do this, you know, partitioning all, all over again, right? But I would say in, in the, in practice, well, in practice, most people don't do radix partitioning, although it is shown to be superior. Um, and then the, the other few systems that I knew that do this, uh, they're mostly academic prototypes. Um, they almost never do two passes. It's usually one pass and you're done. All right, so now we have our, uh, whether or not we've done partitioning, now we enter the build phase. And again, the idea here is that we're gonna scan the outer table, uh, either just in the, the original table itself, or if we partition, then the partitions. And then for every single tuple we're gonna have, uh, we're gonna hash it on the same key we used in the partitioning phase. And then we're gonna store it into a hash table, right? And ideally we, we wanna design our hash table such that the, the size of every bucket that we're writing into is going to be you know, just a few cache lines in size, right? Because that's gonna allow us to go through things more efficiently. So we now need to discuss what this actually hash table is gonna look like, right? So we said like, oh great, the buckets we write into a hash table will be a few cache lines. Well, what, what does that actually mean, right? What, what, is, what, is, what does our hash table actually look like? So to understand what a hash table is, we need, there's, there's two main design decisions. Typically when people say they have a hash table, uh, it's sort of used colloquially just to mean like the data structure itself. Uh, but in, in, in practice, it's actually, com it's a combination of these two things, the, the hash function, and the hashing scheme. So the hash function is a way we're going to take a, take our key that's in a larger domain, a larger space, and we want to map it to a uh, specific location or slot in our, in our hash table data structure, right? So it's like you take all possible strings and we want to ha have a hash function that can then convert it into some integer that we can then say, you know, within one to 10 or some, some, some smaller range, you know, what slot we're, we're going to write into. So I'll we'll see in a second, the, the, we're gonna have this contention between having a hash algorithm that is fast and also having a hash algorithm that has a low collision rate, because we want to make sure that if we take two keys that are distinct, we don't want them to hash to the same location, but we want to be able to compute that hash very quickly. The, the second design decision is the hashing scheme. And this basically says that after you've done the hashing, if now you have two keys that hash to the same location, meaning you have a collision on that key, how do you actually deal with that? And so again, there'll be this trade-off between allocating a ton of memory for a hash table so that every possible hash key I ever see is guaranteed not to collide with any other key, uh, but that would take a lot of memory. And so if I want to support collisions, I want to have my collision uh, reconciliation uh, you know, method or procedure be efficient as possible. So I don't, you know, I'm not spending a lot of computational time to find or insert a new key. Again, we'll, we'll cover each of these uh, one by one. I will say though, uh, although I'll present a bunch of different approaches to doing hash tables or hash functions, every single database system that I ever talked to, or every company that I ever talked to, uh, they usually just pick one. They'll have a reason why they picked it. Like, oh, we ran some benchmarks and it, and it seemed, you know, seemed to work well. Uh, and although in some cases, some hashing schemes might be better than other for different workloads, different query types, nobody, as far as I know, has actually tries to be adaptive. Everyone sort of picks one hash table or one hash function and tries to make that be as efficient as possible. They don't try to automatically adapt the hashing scheme they're using based on what the query of the data set looks like. Everyone just sort of picks one and runs with it. All right, so for hash functions, again, the idea is that we wanna take an arbitrary key of any possible length and any possible domain and then map it to a smaller domain that we can then you know, use that to find a location in our hash table. So this means that although there's, there's hash functions out there that provide security guarantees, or cryptographic hash functions or two-way hash functions that I can encrypt something and decrypt it, we don't care about any of that, right? We all we care about is having an efficient one-way hash with a low collision rate. Um, and we'll see what some examples are in the next, in, in the next slide. 
So the, the best way to understand this trade-off between collision and, and performance is think of the, of the two extremes. So the fastest hash function you could ever have is one where no matter what key you give it, you always return the value one. Right, that's like there's there's no computation. It's just you know writing one to the stack or the or the or the output of the function, and then you're done. But of course, this means that the collision rate is going to be terrible because no matter what key I give it, it always comes back with value one. So it's super efficient, but my collision rate will be is bad. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, I can have what is called perfect hashing, where it's a magic hash function that no matter what key you give it it's guaranteed to always produce a unique hash key. So again, these exist in the literature or in theory, in practice, nobody actually implements them because typically the way you actually implement them is you, you need to know all the keys ahead of time uh, and you, you would then build it with a, uh, the mapping function with, a, with a, a, a hash table itself. So you would need a hash table in order to have a hash table, which is sort of um, defeats the purpose of having you know, uh, an efficient hash table. So again, these are the two extremes. We want something in between. So the, uh, you know, th this is sort of active uh, development area for both research and um, uh, for companies and startups and, and sort of ha hackers in general. So there's this benchmark created by the Murmur2 hash guy uh, called SM Hasher, and this is sort of a benchmark suite that has measurements to determine the, the performance and collision rate of a bunch of different hash functions. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, uh, you can go check out the, his, his blog or the GitHub page for this. But I want to focus quickly on um, just sort of five high-level hash functions that you, you see often in the wild. CRC was originally developed in the 1970s to do error code detection for uh, in, in networking. Um, there's now on, on modern CPUs, there's, there's built-in instructions to do CRC very efficiently. Um, I think in the slides I'll show in the next slide, I don't think I'm using those instructions. Actually, I'm pretty sure I'm not. Uh, so if you just use the algorithm, you know, software-based CRC, it's going to be really slow. If you use the instructions, it'll go faster. Um, MurmurHash was this random dude on the internet who said, hey, here's this hash function I, I, I developed that's general purpose, that well is fast. Uh, a bunch of people seemed to like it. They picked up, picked it up, and sort of expanded upon it or, or modified it. And uh, in particular, there was Google City Hash was based on Murmur Hash, but they designed it for their for their environment where they wanted to do, uh, have efficient hashing for short keys. There's the Facebook XX Hash, which is considered to be the, the state of the art now. Right? This is from the same guy at Facebook that invented Z, Z standard the compression. Um, again, this is sort of doing. Uh, uh, it's just, it's a you know it's a mathematical variation of, of of the of the methods being used in memory hash, and then farm hash is a newer version of city hash that's designed to have better collision rates for uh, larger keys. So there's also in 2016 there was a highway hash uh, from Google, but that that has like guarantees for uh, sort of again cryptic you know cryptographic analysis, so you can't leak any data from from the, the hash functions. Um, Again, we don't care about that in, in our hash table because this, this, you know, we're, using, we're using this hash function internally. It's not exposed to the outside world. So this is just a, a, a benchmark that I run uh, every year where it's, uh, it's not SM Hasher. It's a, it's a different type of workload where it's just trying to measure the throughput rate you can have uh, for these different hash functions. So again, CRC64, I think this is just all software-based. I, I, re I should rewrite that to be use the Harvard instructions. Um, but the, the main takeaway here is a common common thing you'll see is that you have key sizes of either 32 or 64, 64 bits, um, or sorry, 30, well, 32 and 64 bytes. You don't see like super large keys, um, and this is sure to showing that there's uh, if you have if you have key sizes that are aligned to cache lines, then these algorithms can perform more efficiently. So the, sort of the sawtooth patterns is when you have uh, is when you start going to the next cache line and you pay that penalty. So the main takeaway here is that, again, XX hash 3 is considered to be the fastest and then followed by, uh, by city hash and farm hash. But I think this is an older version of Murmur hash 3. I think there might be a newer version that would be, uh, would, could perform better. But again, in our own system, we use XX hash uh, 3 because, that, again, this, this, this determines that things are, this shows that things, it's, it's, it's much better. Okay. So let's talk about now hashing schemes. 
uh, again, the hashing scheme is is what we're, how we handle collisions. So if we have our hash function says this key should hash to this bucket or this slot in our in our in our data structure, and something's already there. How do we deal with it, right? So we'll talk about. And so I was to say too, these are also uh, for the most part, except for chain hashing, these are static hashing schemes, meaning I'm going to size the hash table before I actually do anything with it. So I sort of have a rough approximation of how many keys I'm going to have to store in my hash funk or hash table. And if now I have a collision that I can't reconcile because there's no free space based on, on the protocol I'm using, I then have to resize it. And the way you typically resize it is just you, you double the size and rehash everything and put it back in. Chain hashing, you can just extend the, ch the hash chain, which I'll show in the next slide, uh, indefinitely. But, but this can then degenerate to a, to a sequential scan when you do lookups if everything hashes to the same chain. So chain hash tables, what people think about when they think about a hash table, I think this is what you get in, uh, in Java when you say you want a ha hash map class. Um, and the idea is that there's, a, uh, there's an array of, of pointers to, to chains, uh, and I take my key, I hash it, that tells me what offset I want to look at in my, in my chain, and then I can, uh, I can then then jump, jump to that location, right? And so the way we're going to resolve collisions is that if two keys map to the same chain, we're just going to insert them into the same bucket. And if my bucket gets full, then I just extend it, allocate a new bucket, and I add it to my linked list. So again, the chain can grow uh, infinitely, and if everything hashes to the same location, then, then doing any lookup is a sequential scan. All right. So uh, let's look at a quick example. So ignore this for now, but like here's our buckets. And again, so within each bucket, we have two slots. So I take my first key, I'm going to hash it, and the, uh, it's going to map to this bucket here. This bucket is empty, so I can insert my key into the first slot. So the thing to point out here, though, is that we want to store both the, the, ha the hash of the key as well as the original key. And the reason why we want to store the hash is because now if we want to do a comparison to see does A exist, if we already have the hash, we can do that comparison very quickly with just integers. But if this key is like a varchar or something larger, then we obviously need to make sure that this thing, we have this original key so we can determine whether we have a, we have a false positive. But we keep this one as well so that we can do that lookup more efficiently. So A goes here, we can write to that first location. B, B goes he, here, uh, it can write to that location. C goes here, right, match to the same bucket. This slot is empty, so it can write into there. But now D wants to write into this bucket, uh, but the two slots are full. So all we need to do is now allocate a new bucket, uh, add a pointer from the first bucket to the second bucket in our linked list, and now we can add in D. Same thing for E. This bucket is full, we follow the chain and go here, and now we, we can write E. And then F gets written down here. So again, now if I want to do a lookup, say find me key D, D would, would hash to this bucket. I would do a sequential scan within the bucket looking in every single key. Typically you do it with the hash first because that'll be more efficient. Uh, if I don't find a match, then I know I need to, uh, and, and there's, there's, if I don't find a match in the bucket I'm at, and there's a pointer to it, the next bucket, then I need to jump over here and continue my sequential scan. So one interesting optimization you can do with the slot array is uh, instead of storing these as 64-bit pointers, or you store, them, you store pointers at 64 bits, because that's what in the Intel hardware tells you you have to do, uh, but Intel actually doesn't use all 64 bits for every address. It actually only uses 48 bits. So in the case of Hyper, what they do is they actually store for all these pointers, they store a uh, bitmap, or sorry, a bloom filter that says, here's all the, the keys that exist in my chain. So now what I can do is when I do a hash and I say, I should go to this bucket and I, I look at this pointer to tell me where I need to go, there's actually gonna be a bloom filter inside of it that I could then check to see whether the key I'm looking for is actually gonna exist in my bloom filter because the bloom filter will give you it won't give you false negatives, but it could give you false positives. So it could tell you this key exists, and when it actually doesn't, you have to go scan and find it just to see that it doesn't exist. But if it doesn't exist in your key, then this thing will be guaranteed to say it doesn't exist. So you don't even actually need to follow the chain. You just need to look at this bloom filter. So I think for this reason, the, the, the hyper guys say that the, the, hash, the ha chain hash table is superior to all other hash tables if you do this, this one trick. The problem, though, is although I, I, 
I potentially agree with that. The problem is that the Intel is not guaranteed to only use 60, 48 bits for all pointers in the future, right? At some later point, they may say, all right, well, now we use all 64 bits, and then this thing doesn't work. So then maybe they could just store the 16-bit you know, bloom filter and pat it out, uh, sort of like the, the Judy fat pointers we saw with the Judy arrays. You could store that on, on the, in the slot array as well. All right, the, so chain hashing is pretty common um, in data structure used in, in database systems. For joins, though, most of the time you see a, a linear probe hash table uh, because it's so simple and, and it just ends up being more efficient. So with linear probe hash table, think of it as just, it's a giant table of slots. And I'm going to hash my key and I'm going to mod it by the number of slots that I have, and that's going to tell me where to jump to find the, the memory address of the slot that I want. So when I want to do an insert, if nothing exists in that slot, then I can just go ahead and write into it. If something does exist, then I need to scan down in, in going from the top to the bottom from that slot location and look at all the slots until I find one that is empty. And then I can go ahead and insert my value in it. Now this means that when I want to do a lookup to find my key, I'm going to slot, you know, jump to that same location and I have to start looking to see whether the key I'm looking for is, is actually there. It's because I don't know if it's got, if it's not actually in the slot that it should hash to, it may be below that. I need to scan through in, until I find it or I find an empty slot, which tells me that the key doesn't exist. So let's just look at an example of this. Say again, I want to, I want to put these keys in here. First one, we hash A, we mod it by the number of slots and that tells us we want to write into here. That's fine. No, nothing was already in there. So we can go ahead and do that. Now I want to do hash on B. I can write this slot. Nothing's there. So we're, we're done. Now I want to do an insert on C. C hashes to this slot location, but A already exists, so I can't store it here. I'm going to store it at the next empty slot I can find, which is just the one below it. So again, now if I want to do a lookup on C, I would hash here, C A, and that, I would see the, the key A, that's not the one I'm looking for, so then I, I, I scan down until I find either an empty slot or the key that I want. So in this case here, I would find C in the next location. Now with D, D hashes of this location. Again, we can't write it because into there because C's already here. So we write it to the next one. E wants to write to A. We can't do that. We can't write to the next one. Can't write to the next one and keep going until we find our empty slot. Like that. F like, likewise writes to, wants to write here, but it can't. So it goes, goes to the next one. So the thing you got to keep track of with this is if I do a lookup or an insert, I need to keep track of what was my starting location into the slot array for this table because if I loop back around trying to find the thing I'm looking for or empty slot and I, and I come back to my starting point, then I know my hash table is full and there's no more free spaces for me to insert something or I, I, the key I'm looking for uh, is, is not there. Um, then I have to again rehash everything and, and by doubling the size or build a new hash table by doubling the size and rehashing everything. So again, trying to pick out the right hash table size can be tricky, and we'll see in a few more lectures uh, how this can be problematic if you don't get the if you don't estimate things correctly the first time. So the other interesting thing about this data structure, and we'll see some variations in in the, in, in the next slides, is that it's going to penalize the the collision scheme is going to penalize both inserts and lookups uh, in the same way. So in the case of this one here, I wanted to insert E uh, and I had to jump down to four slots and to, to, to store it here. If now I want to do a lookup on E, I'm going to pay that same penalty because I'm going, to, I'm going to hash here and I have to scan down until I find again an empty slot or the key that I'm looking for. So there's nothing in this collision scheme or this hashing scheme that prefers making inserts be faster or make, prefers making uh, lookups be faster. In a hash join, uh, depending on whether the, 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 the size of the, of the inner table versus the outer table, depending on that ratio, you may want to choose a different collision scheme that makes inserts go faster if the, the outer table is bigger, or lookups, lookups go faster if the inner table is larger. Um, but again, as I said, as far as I know, most data systems don't, don't switch up. It's, they always pick one scheme. And oftentimes, this one is, is the simplest one. And, performs, and that research shows that this performs the best. Okay, <clears throat> so the uh, we've already sort of talked about this. You know, in order to reduce the number of wasteful comparisons that we have to do, uh, 
we want to try to avoid collisions on hash keys. Of course, that entirely depends on how good our collision rate is for a hash function. Um, and one way to avoid this entirely is that we can just have a huge uh, hash table with 2x number of slots we expect to have so that every single time you hash a key and put it into the, the data structure, uh, it's, there's nothing going to be in the slot that it's trying to write to. But again, you pay that penalty of, of allocating more memory for your hash table. So how to again balance this correctly is, is, is not trivial. So look, let's look at some variations of uh, linear probe hashing uh, that do try to switch the dynamic or switch the penalty between inserts and, and, and lookups um, by, by changing how the, the, collision, uh, the collision protocol we're going to use. So one approach is called Robinhood hashing. And the idea here is that when we do an insert, if we find that the slot we want to insert into is already occupied, then we look to see whether the key that exists in the slot we want to write to is farther away from its home slot or its, its, its the slot where it should be than where our key is. And if it isn't, then we're going to steal its slot and force it that other key we just, we just evicted to go to a new location. So it's called Robin Hood hashing because the idea is that we're going to have poor keys steal from the, or we're going to steal from the, the rich keys and give the slots to the poor keys. And again, this, the, the wealth of a key is based on how many hops you are, you are away from uh, your, your, the, the position, the optimal position for you where, you where you should be in the table. All right. So this is an old technique. Uh, it was originally published in, in a tech report in, or in a, in, a public, in a paper in 1985. It sort of was lost, or not lost, sort of like really didn't get any attention until recent years. Um, in, in particular, this showed up on Hacker News a, few, uh, a couple years ago. And now sort of this is, this, there are a few systems that actually are using this. Although I will say the research shows that this is actually a, a bad idea because you pay a penalty of uh, just copying and moving is, is, is expensive. All right, so let's say it's the same keys we want to have before. Again, Robin hashing is in a variation of linear probe hashing, so it's just a, a, a giant slot array. We start off by hashing A, that goes here, uh, just like before. But now, in addition to storing the hash in the original key, we're also going to store the number of jumps that this key is from its optimal position. And the optimal position is determined by where it should have been, uh, when, you know, what was the first location that we, we jumped to when we did our, our initial hash, right? Like, if you were looking for this key and used this hashing, you know, use the hash function, where could you find it immediately, assuming there wasn't any other collisions? Same thing for B now. B hashes up here. It's, it's in its optimal position, so it's the number of hops it is from away from where it, where it should be is zero. But now we're going to hash C. C is going to land in the same position where A is. So now we need to look at our, to see whether uh, we should evict whatever's in the slot we want to go into, or should we leave it alone and, and jump down to the next slot, just like in linear probing. So at this first jump here, the A is, A is zero hops away from its, its uh, optimal position, and C is zero hops from its original position, so C will leave A alone, right? Because they're considered equivalent. So then now it'll jump down here. This slot was empty, so now we'll store C in here. So now this is saying that C is one hop away from where it should have been uh, originally. D comes along here. D wants to go where C is located. C has a uh, has a hop cost of or a hop distance of one, therefore one is greater than zero for D because D you know D is zero steps if it, if it could go here. So in this case here, C is considered more poor than D, so D will leave C alone, and then we jump down here and we write D. Now we write E. E wants to go where A is. It can't do that. A A zero is equal to E zero, so we we leave it alone. Then we come down here, and at this point, E is now one hop away from where it should be, but oh, so is C, so they're also equivalent, so we leave those alone. But then we get here, and now E is two hops away from where it should be, and D is only one hop away. So, so D is considered more rich or more wealthy than E, so E is allowed to steal this slot, insert its key in, and then now the thread continues on and figures out the next location to put D, which is the next empty slot. And then now D is two hops away from, from where it should be. And then now we get to F. F should go where, where D is, but it can't do that. Uh, so then it goes down here. 
So again, the idea here is that we're amortizing uh, by doing this, this, this stealing the slots and reinserting keys that are already in the table. The idea is that we're amortizing the search cost of, of any given key by having each key be uh, closer to where they should have been uh, originally. So going, going back here with, with E, under um, regular linear probe, E would have ended up here and D would have been left alone here. So E would have been three, three hops away from, from its original location and D would have been left, left alone with, with, with at one hop away. But on a Robin Hood, they both end up being two hops away. So on average, you're saying the lookups are, are, are roughly equivalent across all keys uh, so that you don't have one key you know, take, take much longer than other ones. So this seems like a, a decent idea, right? It seems, seems kind of interesting, but the research literature shows that it is bad because this, this stealing the, the keys uh, is terrible for, for you know, cash performance. Uh, and so it makes the insert so much more expensive that any benefit you get from doing the, the, the lookup or making the finds go faster is completely negated. Now, for a hash join, uh, you know, we're building these ephemeral hash tables where we, we insert them, do our probes in the, in the build phase, or sorry, the probe phase, and then throw it away. If your data structure might be longer living, uh, like you build a hash table and then keep doing lookups over and over again, then this approach actually might might be preferable. But for hash joins, it, it won't be. Another technique is called hopscotch hashing, uh, which came out in 2008 from uh, Maurice Hurley, uh, who used to be faculty here at CMU and now is a professor at Brown. And so the idea here is that rather than letting a uh, rather than letting a key change position, uh, like in Robin Hood hashing, to any possible location in the in the uh, in the in the slot array, we're going to bound how far they can go uh, into what's called a neighborhood. So a neighborhood will be defined as a a contiguous range of slots that a key is allowed to exist, and it, it can exist anywhere in 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 that in this neighborhood. So if you're looking for a key and you look in this, where it should be in this neighborhood and it's not there, then you know the key doesn't exist. So, so you, you bound how far you actually have to uh, scan through. So the size of the neighborhood is being configurable. Uh, I forget what the original paper says, um, but in, 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 for this example here, we'll use a key size or neighborhood size of three. So again, it's just linear probing. So we have our, we have our slot array, uh, and so the first neighborhood for this first position here will be size of three. So one, two, three. But the neighborhoods are overlapping. So for the next one and the next one, and so forth. Right, they they have a portion of the previous neighborhood in in their neighborhood, right? And you, you would do this all the way down. So now let's say I want to start, start inserting these keys. So just like before, I want to insert A. It, it's it, it would go in here, and its neighborhood is is three three slots. So I can insert it anywhere that I want. In practice, though, you just insert it into the first location if it's empty, right? And then we're done. Then we do an insert for B. Same thing. We go to the first location in, in its neighborhood, and we're done. But now we want to insert C. C should go where A is, but it can't because A is occupying it. Uh, so we're, we say we need to find the next empty slot uh, in our neighborhood to insert into. into right? So we just do it now, sequential scan down until we find an empty slot, and we go ahead and insert ourselves. Right? So, that's, so far, this is the same thing as, as linear probing. Now I want to insert D. D should go where C is. Uh, again, sequential scan down until I find that, and then I can insert in there. But now I want to insert E. And E needs to go in this neighborhood. But if I, as I do my sequential scan, I would find that all these, these slots in my neighborhood are occupied. So now I need to go outside my neighborhood and find the first free slot, which happens to be here. And so now what I want to do is I want to determine whether I can swap uh, in reverse order any key or any key in my previous neighborhood that I'm trying to get into with the, this empty slot. And that way I could then insert my key into my neighborhood. And the idea here is to make sure that we bound whatever key we're moving to make sure that it is in our slot here. So in case of D, right, D should belong here. So its neighborhood are these two things, one, two, three. So it's okay for D to then get moved down here and then we can hash uh, E and put it into our neighborhood. And then we're done. It, now I insert F. F should go where D is, its neighborhood are these two and this one because we wrap around. 
And in this case here, I can just scan down, I find the free slot and I, I, I can insert it, right? So how this works is that you have to maintain some metadata about in every neighborhood about what keys are in them uh, or in what, you know, what, you know, what neighborhood I belong to. So you can make, make a determination of if all my keys in my neighborhood that I'm trying to get in, into are all occupied or all belong in my neighborhood, then I, I'm, I, have to, I have to double the size of the hash table and, build, and, and rebuild it. So the idea here is we're bounding how much we have to look uh, to find a free slot to just be local in my neighborhood. And if I can't insert anything in my neighborhood or I don't find the key I'm looking for in my neighborhood, then I don't need to potentially scan the entire thing. So it's just a, it's a variation, I think, of Robinhood hashing where you're bounding how much, you know, how you're bounding the insertion uh, search space and the, the lookup space. All right, the last hashing scheme we'll talk about are cuckoo hashing. And this is me different than all the other ones where we are, if we hash something, we, you, you know, you're not guaranteed that the slot you jump, first slot you jump into is gonna be exactly the thing, you know, it will be exactly where your key can be found. In the case of, of hopscotch hashing, it would be in the neighborhood. In the case of linear probing or Robinhood hashing, you have to keep scanning down until you find the key you're looking for or you find an empty space. But with cuckoo hashing, when you hash, you do a lookup and you're guaranteed either the key doesn't exist or the first place you jump into will be the key that you want. And so the way they can achieve this is that they're gonna maintain multiple hash tables simultaneously, each with the, their own hash function. So now when I wanna do an insert, I hash it multiple times and I see whether I can insert it into any free slot in any, any of my tables. And if now that slot is being occupied, then I'm gonna steal that slot take that key out and then have that, that key I evicted and rehash that and put that into another table. And the idea is that you could have this thing changing, changing one hash table, a key, you could have a key that already has been inserted change its hash table multiple times.
Bank it in the side pocket. What is this? Some old bullshit. Hey, yo, hey, yo. What? Took a sip and had to spit because I ain't with that beer called the O.E. Because I'm O.G. Ice Cube down with the S.T.I. You looked and it was gone. Grab me a 40 just to get my buzz on. Because I needed just a little more kick. Hooked like a fish after just one sip. Yo. Put it to my lips and ripped the top off. Eight ball just dropped off. Because ain't eyes hopped off. Uh. 